I've always been a bit of a contrarian, and I've often rooted for the underdog. That has impacted my theory on where to go and where to invest in the world. Now, if you want to go out and pay too much for a pair of Louis Vuitton shoes because you just like the look of them, even though you know you could buy a similar pair of shoes somewhere else for less, that's okay. But if you're going to go and invest in a country and put all of your resources into one country and hope that because they are a brand name and they've gotten all the attention that somehow you'll get more out of that as an investor, I think that just doesn't make sense. So in this video, I'm going to share five lesser known markets that are on my watch list for investment. Hey guys, I'm Andrew Henderson. If you want to learn how the Nomad Capitalist team can personally help you create a holistic offshore plan to keep more of your own money, grow your money faster in other markets, do cool things like get second passports, go to nomadcapitalist.com and learn more. Now let's talk about uh, little known or lesser known markets. These are for the contrarians who want to go off the beaten path. I'm going to give you five in particular. Now, let me be clear, I'm not necessarily saying that I'm investing in these markets or I'm advising you to invest in these markets. I don't make investment recommendations on this channel. Uh, some of these markets may not pan out. That's why I'm saying they're markets to watch. But I do think they have some interesting trends that are on my radar for different reasons. And so we'll start with uh, kind of the most um, uh, basic one and, and head to the most exotic ones that we're watching. Now, also understand that my Nomad Capitalist team and I are constantly tracking things like real estate data. Uh, we're looking at different indexes in terms of economic freedom. We're tracking laws in the country. And so my goal, one of, just to understand my perspective, it is uh, countries that are opening up to things like immigration, uh, things like foreign capital, those are good signs to us. And those are a lot of the indications that we use to, to look at these markets, things like lower taxes as well. So here we go. The number one market that I'm watching right now is Colombia. Now, people have heard of Colombia. Certainly Colombia has uh, a reputation from decades ago that was less than savory. And so that's part of why I've liked this market. We've talked about it for years, but I still wanted to put it on this list because it is thought of as a lesser market. When you look at a lot of investments uh, in the Latin America region, Colombia often gets overlooked, even though it is uh, one of the freest economies in Latin America, even though they've made progress, even though they're relatively open for things like immigration, uh, the financial system not so open, uh, but they are moving in the right direction. Now, Latin America operates differently than, than some parts of the world. If you're expecting a, you know, Mikhail Saakashvili takes on Georgia and just blows the place up and, you know, eliminates 80% of the taxes in, you know, three days, uh, then that's not what you're going to generally get in Latin America. But by Latin American standards, and, and as, a, as a continent, South America is, is uh, actually growing by some metrics faster than Asia now in, in economic terms. Um, I think Colombia is one of the better performance there. I recently invested in a property, um, which I think has great investment potential. I think we did relatively good on the, uh, relatively well on the, on the numbers. Um, it's also a lifestyle opportunity for me. Uh, but I have put my money where my mouth is, and we are doing more of that. I think Bogota in particular is the capital. Very interesting. I think Colombia gets a bad rap. And while we've talked about it before, I think it deserves a spot on this sheet. Now let's head to Europe. Number two is Ukraine. Again, people know of Ukraine. You know, the first thing that a lot of people tell me they know about Ukraine is, is Chernobyl. And now again, that's 30 plus years ago at this point. And so um, Ukraine has certainly had some, some difficulties in recent years. It's been on the news. With the election of the new president, I'm actually very eager to see what's going to happen in Ukraine. And I think that, you know, prices having already gone up in key markets like Kyiv, uh, I uh, would not be waiting much longer if it's a place where you want to invest. Now, Ukraine has been a place where people have hired um, you know, great place to, to staff your, your nomad capitalist style company. If you want to hire people who are smart, who are on the ball, uh, I think it's going to become an increasing destination for investment. Again, prices have already gone up. The best time to buy was, uh, about four or five years ago, uh, you would have done very well. Um, but I think there is an opportunity. I think that this government is going to be very interesting to watch. We're going to see it unfold this year. Uh, and, uh, I think that you'll probably see some very interesting things happening there. 
Number three, nearby in Armenia, new government there as well. I think they're going to move a little bit more slowly uh, with reforms, but I, I've been very positive on, on Armenia. One thing I like about Armenia that I, I, is probably similar to Ukraine is the human capital. I always talk about culture, okay? If you don't have a good culture, you can just forget it. If you've got a highly nationalistic, angry bunch of people who don't know much about anything, um, that's going to be something that's, that's not going to work for you. Open cultures where they just have historically had different groups of people, um, Malaysia being one of them, for example. You have three main groups of Malaysians, okay, but they're different ethnicities. Um, I think that's a positive thing because people understand, you know, let's welcome foreign capital, let's welcome people in. And so Armenians, I mean, the diaspora, it's all over the place. Um, and a lot of those people bring capital back, they bring knowledge back, they bring the attitude back. And so you've got a really great uh, group of hardworking people there. And now I think you've got uh, a government that it's very interesting, certainly a smaller domestic market, pretty small domestic market. But I think, uh, you know, you've seen small domestic markets, uh, you know, before do very well by using human capital. So I think Armenia is going to be interesting to watch. Um, pushing through some of the things that have, that have held them back in recent years uh, by corruption. Uh, I think that's going to be a very interesting one to watch. Now, let's go to uh, Central Asia. This is probably the most exotic one, so that should be last, but we're just kind of moving across the map here. So uh, the most exotic recommendation that is the most interesting to watch, I'm not sure what to make of it yet, uh, is Uzbekistan. I've started talking about Uzbekistan a little bit because I'm studying some of the companies from the region, uh, like Georgian companies and, and others, that are going into Uzbekistan. Uh, I believe it was TBC Bank, someone at TBC Bank in Georgia said, we're noticing a lot of the same kind of reforms in Uzbekistan that we saw back in the early 2000s here in Georgia. Okay. You have seen some opening up to foreign capital, not fully opened up in terms of owning real estate, but I think they're heading in that direction. And so I'm not entirely sure what to make of it right now. Um, I think it's an interesting call option at this point. Certainly, you know, the, the, the time to get in on deals uh, is when things are a total mess. Go and talk to some of my friends in, in, in Tbilisi, Georgia and other places. Um, you know, in, in, in Armenia and, and in Russia um, in the 90s. I mean, my apartment in Tbilisi, they said you probably could have paid $5,000 for this in the 90s. Um, people were buying property in Russia, places like St. Petersburg. Their property's gone up 10 or 20 fold since the 90s. These markets were chaos at this point. I mean, literally, uh, Georgian friends of mine uh, said, you know, Luckily, we had, a, we had some farmland. We could uh, go and grow some beans because we were sharing a can of tuna fish among our whole family every day. Some people just moved from those countries you know, to Russia uh, to, to get a job. Uh, so you know, are you willing to invest at that time? I don't think Uzbekistan is there now, but it's certainly it's, it's, it's not as developed as many of the, these other countries, as a Georgia, as a Colombia, as even a Ukraine. Uh, but, I think it's an interesting call option now. I think it'll be also interesting to watch to see as they open up. I think Uzbekistan is potentially moving in the right direction. Now let's go to the east, number five, Mongolia. For a while, uh, I had written Mongolia off as um, being a place that was overhyped. Mongolia and Myanmar, I feel like, were frontier markets that were overhyped. Mongolia obviously has a tiny domestic economy, which doesn't always bother me. But it was very, you know, resource dependent. It was based on this play that they're between, you know, Russia and China, uh, and that's interesting. But I'd written it off as kind of being overheated and just kind of being um, this this market that was propped up. I think uh, you know, people started to share that opinion, and uh, due to a lot of different forces, people kind of lost interest in Mongolia. I almost think it's worth watching at this point just to see, you know, what happens going forward. They do still have a lot of resources. They have a lot of things of value. The issue is merely the price point. The issue is, is merely, you know, is everything so overpriced because of speculation? I think at this point, it's going to be interesting to watch um, what happens. And is there an opportunity? That's one thing that I'm going, to be, I'm going to be checking on this year, including with some of my friends who are in Asia who do Asian-focused investments. So those are five markets that I'm interested to watch. I'm not saying that I'm investing in them. I'm not saying you should do anything. I'm saying merely I'm watching them. Uh, we're going to be talking about what we find and my thoughts uh, a number of months from now coming up at Nomad Capitalist Live. 
uh, our live conference. We're going to be talking about some of these markets in greater depth, other markets that I've liked for a long time. So if you want to hear more, you can join us there. I think what's really important is um, always to be looking for the next place. I'm always looking for the next place. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm always looking for highly speculative or frontier or emerging markets, uh, particularly as my portfolio expands uh, and I want to also you know, have a nice lifestyle. I don't want to live in Mongolia. right? Uh, I think having some property in developed markets could be good. Having some property in emerging markets could be good. I happen to like living in markets uh, like Georgia, Montenegro, Colombia, Malaysia, Mexico. Some of those aren't that emerging. Um, but you know, I think part of a portfolio should be in places that are coming up next. Not every part of your portfolio has to be super productive, by the way. You know, your portfolio does not have to be 100% optimized. But you know, what I don't want people to fall into the trap of is, ooh, Singapore, like I hear that's the place where it's safe to invest. Yeah, it's safe to invest. You'll pay a you know, million dollars for a, a shoebox. Um, and then you'll pay a you know, 20% tax to the government just for the privilege of investing in their country. You know, what's the next Singapore? That's what I've been telling you from day one. What's the next Singapore? Oh, okay, that's Georgia. Cool. Eventually their prices get a little bit higher. becomes a little bit harder to find good deals. Cool. What's the next Georgia? You just keep going down the pike. So always watching the next markets, always looking for the next best thing. To me, that's very important. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your Nomad Capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, Learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.